Welcome everybody to another uh, stack of 10 comics. So I have a, a stack of 10 of various sizes here. I found it actually much more difficult to put 10 together today because, uh, you know, I guess I, I'll get back to like, I know the last couple I haven't really done like Thor or anything like that. I've been more or less behind on like the Thor. I guess I did Hulk last time. But uh, you know, most of my monthly comics right now that I'm buying in singles are either X-Men or Star Wars, essentially. Maybe here and there I try um, uh, a first issue or something. But I've even fallen away from getting first issues of Image. And now I just wait to see if it looks cool or if it made it through six or if it looks like it's going to stick around to buy the trade or something. Um, so, yeah, and, uh, you know, I could talk about X-Men if there was something specific to talk about, but I think X-Men would be funner, more fun to talk with someone about that's also reading it rather than just, you know, get into the, the meat of what's happening in Star Wars X-Men, although sometimes I will still show it, but I haven't lately. So I actually, ha I've had trouble because otherwise I'm, you know, reading things that are a bit thicker. Um, and then the other, other part is, you know, I'm reading a lot of, still reading a lot of digital stuff or reading even more. And there's some interesting stuff too there, but you know, I want to be able to hold the book and talk about it and whatnot. So, I mean, I, because of the, the, the podcast manga splaining, which I think I've referenced here before, I, I, I read a online book called Kowloon Generic Romance. And it was a pretty little bit, I guess in the sense of, I'm going to say it love everlasting. That's because I don't really read romance books, but in the you know, same idea where I sort of had to go through what I see as a generic romance that I'm not interested in. And then I got some kind of kicker at the end, which um, I think is interesting because I've never read something like that. Something that was like, in the case of Love Everlasting, like 80% romance and then a cool, you know, weirdo kicker at the end that made me like it. I did get to, a lot of people are just reading Love Everlasting. Um, I did get to issue four or maybe five, I think four. And you know, I just, I got a little bit bored of it. I will read the whole thing and see what goes on. I don't know how you can keep that up. The, you know, that shtick up. So I'm sure Tom King and um, I think her name's Elizabeth Chartier. I can't, I can't remember if her first name's Elizabeth. Last name's definitely Chartier. And uh, I don't know if you can keep that up. Um, and so Kowloon Generic Robance is the same. So set in some alternate history of the uh, wall, Kowloon Walled City um, that uh, people have a lot of interest in. Uh, but um, um, but yeah, it was enough of a curveball at the end that I, you know, I'm going to continue it in some fashion. Uh, I've started trying to make it so that I get my money's worth out of uh, a lot of these digital platforms that I pay for. So, I, I, you know, I pay for DC. I pay for the Marvel one, I pay for Comixology, <clears throat> and I pay um, pretty cheap for Shonen Jump. So I've started tr tr deciding to um, track that, and I don't know how that's going to work into like these reviews because I do want to hold it. And uh, but I've been recording these on my phone since my my computer, my non-work computer is is a little bit slow now, and uh, you know I don't have enough reason to buy a good computer yet. So yeah, a bunch of stuff there. X-Men um, that John's Comics with Kids is doing. I've been reading those digital, but you know, they're single issues that I don't have in my hand, so until I figure it out. But, and so instead I have this beautiful stack. One of them I'm gonna show, I actually read a long time ago. This is Saga, volume 10. Now, there, uh, I read this uh, along with most people as it was new, but I was reading it digital on Hoopla, but, um, Prior to it coming back, my wife and I had been reading um, Saga and Trade, and that's how we enjoyed it. So I kept buying the trades. She wasn't reading it on Hoopla, so this is mostly for her. She hasn't really started it yet. Um, oh, Swamp Thing is my guest here today. I decided just to leave that there. Let's see how that works out. Let's see if it ruins the the um, uh, the focus here. So uh, I I like it. You know, I don't know that it I, it's been gone so long and at least among comic readers, it's already sort of, you know, tattooed on the era. And it's actually even older than I think I thought. I think it goes all the way back to like 13 or 14. So, I mean, 
you know, it was a three year break and it was a long time. So I don't know that it's gonna, it can have the same effect. It's the shipping certainly doesn't help because we got the one trade and then they're taking another six months off. <clears throat> so in a lot of ways, I think maybe Fiona Apple, Fiona Apple, Fiona Staples uh, can't keep up with her own level of quality. And I'll admit, I, everyone loves the, um, you know, you hear a lot about Fiona Staples art in here, but, um, but I've always thought it was just okay. So, you know, and he does, Brian K. Bond does his little shtick with, uh, likes to do his shtick where he's like, I'm lefty. I'm a, I'm, you know, I know about social justice, um, which I like, you know, I have a trans character, blah, blah, blah. And then he'll, um, you know, but then he'll still try to be a bit of an edgelord, which is, you know, on the nose, but, um, but, you know, it's his style. He's done it for a long time. His questions at the end of the issues are weird. I actually, I was in a discussion with Gore Vidal a while ago. This is in the middle of the, of the hiatus. And, um, you know, he was talking about the questions, which I did not know about, or if I did, I never read them and just was, I passed on from them because I was reading them in trade. Uh, -huh. and then I found... I found a couple people answering the questions, which I think is cool enough to do. I mean, I didn't find them as weird. I think they were very personal, but you can choose not to answer them, right? But I mean, he does something like, man, I hate unnecessary violence. So this is the bad guy in it. I told you, if I told you, if you just be chill, you and your other people are going to get out of this healthy, wealthy, and wise. But if you don't show me some skin right the fuck now, I'm going to haul your kids up here and rape them to death in front of you. And then, oops, I probably should have thrown in a trigger warning, huh? Um, you know, and I remember when that happened, that was a, uh, you know, that was quite the ending for some people. And I will say, if I would have read this in trade, I probably would have went right past that, um, go, oh, that was dark, but went to the very next page. It's actually clever uh, the way that they, you know, pretty clever the way that, he got around that because I will admit, I go, well, how's she getting out of this? <laughs> you know, um, but in issue three, it was pretty, pretty clever the way they got around it. But nonetheless, I think that that would have had less effect on me if I would have sat and read it in trade. Um, and that's not only, you know, effect from the actual writer, but what he was looking for, uh, which is a reaction. And I certainly in our little community, I heard um, a ton of reaction from it. So, you know, good or bad, I'm not sure. It didn't really stop uh, a lot of people that thought that was disgusting from continuing to read it. And, uh, apparently we've sort of moved on from it and, uh, and we're, you know, back waiting and talking about more about the, uh, shipping issues than we are anything else and the break. So it was good. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know that Saga can have that same effect. Even if it does get to the same quality, you know, there's a little bit less surprise and um, there's definitely not less interest because supposedly that, that comeback issue sold more than any issue or shipped more than any issue uh, for the entire series. So, um, and he has an idea in the, you know, he knows how it's going to end. He has an idea. And so, well, we'll see. There's still a lot of time before we get to that idea and who knows how much it'll change. Um, so I have started trying to read as much Alan Moore as I can um, in the close of this year. And I mostly, when I thought, oh, I'm gonna read Alan Moore at the close of this year, I was thinking of the stuff that I've already read and has affected me and is one of the reasons why he's my favorite writer. And, um, you know, maybe I should move this one higher up for the talk. Um, but, uh, you know, and those books would be, I'm gonna try to read From Hell reread from hell. I'm going to try to read V for Vendetta and Watchmen, which I was reading, you know, outside of the first volume of Sandman, the first few issues of Watchmen, at least because I've started and not finished a couple times, but the first few issues of Watchmen are definitely in my most ever read, um, books that I continue to revisit. I almost might skim the first couple issues when I reopen it up because I'm not, I've probably only read 
I probably only read like the last three twice, last four twice. Um, Watchmen, From Hell, V for Vendetta. So obviously um, there was something in the culture for those because I read those in high school and shortly after there were movies made after them. I'm not sure when From Hell came out. That might have came out when I was in high school, if it was the late 90s. Um, but then there's a lot of stuff I haven't read. I only thought I didn't get into the first volume of Swamp Thing as much as other people did. And uh, at least it didn't make me run to go get volume two. I have checked those out, so I do want to read Swamp Thing. I got um, Miracle Man, and that one's actually going pretty slow. And, you know, in some ways I'm thinking that um, some of that earlier stuff you know, maybe might not have as big effect on me when I've read things like um, Watchmen, of course, but V for Vendetta and From Hell. Um, and those things are a little bit more in my wheelhouse too, I think, than something like Miracle Man. Um, the other thing that makes me worried, and I guess I'm going to jump before I talk about this book specifically, is I want to read the, so the books I bought with my own money, which was, you know, a few years after high school, which seemed new when you compare it to the stuff that he's writing in the 80s and early 90s, are all the ABC stuff. And well, while Promethea definitely needs a reread, I've never finished it. I, how, I got to whatever 20 something issues or whatever buying it and then I might have moved here to Vegas or whatever happened, I never continued with it. And I have them all up to almost the end or at least the end, the initial, uh, the initial runs. But I'm a little bit afraid of reading something like Tom Strong and Top 10 again because um, my reaction for the last few years is I don't really like the, you know, throwback campy, which is what this Santos Sisters book is. So I'm going to go back to that Heart of Ice book in a little bit. And it's like, you know, it's cute and it's a little bit like of a, you know, there's no boobs in it or anything, but like an adult Archie obviously is the style and they even make sure for authenticity and presentation, it's great because they make sure they give you a, um, you know, a, a modern feeling newsprint. But it's just so, to me, it's just so bland to do something like this. And, you know, I get what they're trying to do. I do buy everything from Floating World, but um, this is going to be probably the first one that I'm going to quit on. And I'm glad I didn't say anything about it on Twitter because the guy retweeted me and stuff. And I'm not trying to cut everyone down. I'm the only person that doesn't like this. So um, anyway, and so in that, you know, in the spirit of that, it makes me worried that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like Tom Strong again if I read it, or just because I'm not in the mood for the, you know, for the tribute to the past pulp kind of thing. Um, but I will anyway. I read Promethea. I can't even remember the fourth one. Top ten. Promethea. Tom Strong. And there's a fourth one that. Oh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Of course. There you go. And that's like literature pulp. So this one is uh, Nemo, Heart of Ice. This happens somewhere in between. I think there's a couple more. I think there's 1910 um, that I saw for pretty cheap. But um, for whatever whatever reason, this is the one I picked up or I might have just seen it for cheap at a, at a used bookstore or something. It feels new. Now the book was cool. Uh, the Kevin O'Neill art is is fine. I, I like it fine. And I read a, a review after I read this and I was, you know, I would have liked this book just fine if it didn't say Alan Moore and didn't come with those expectations. Let's say that. Uh, and there's part of it, part of me thinks I've maybe missed something in it because um, the publisher's weekly little capsule review said um, something about some writing technique that, that completely went beyond me. In fact, I think that um, even though it was this is a 48-page book, uh, there were times where uh, the transitions or on what was happening uh, weren't clean enough and a little bit weird and, and hard to follow, to be honest. Um, I slowed down and I got it and I, you know, reread re a line or whatever. I wasn't tired or anything. But um, it, at the end of the day, take out this uh, stupid idea I have an Alan Moore in my head. And it was just a really fun adventure and chase book that I will continue to read. I have this idea to just find not only that, because he kept doing League of Extraordinary Gentlemen in some fashion, is to just find all of them. And I know that they've done here and there, so um, some of those might be harder than it's worth to find. 
Um, but I really did enjoy League of, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen when it was coming out too. And I liked the movie, but I guess I, maybe I was in the mood for it. I only watched it when it came out. So, um, you know, and I had a, I had a pretty decent, I wonder when it, I wonder when it came out in, um, in comparison to what comic, how deep it was into the comic book run. But, um, next up is Chun-Li. Oh, wait, Street Fighter Masters Chun-Li. That's the blank cover. So I bought it for the one day, and I've never done this, that I'll get someone to sketch covers. There's the real cover. So if it's not Marvel, they put the real cover under it. That's what I learned. But Marvel, if you get the blank cover, you're fucked. That's the blank cover. Um, so these kind of books, these comics that are based on Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, and, and I don't know, there's plenty of books based on video games, but most video games have more intricate plots than uh, most, most books. The exceptions are fighting games and, um, and games like Call of Duty. Uh, so no matter what you do, the comic book is much more deep than the very shallow story in Street Fighter. And uh, whenever I pick these up, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, I just actually uh, really enjoy them in some cartoony anime-ish way. Uh, the one thing I do want to, you know, and they're, they're silly and, and dorky or whatnot, and you have to, like, figure out how to not really do it in this book, but at least in the movies, they're always, like, trying to force in a tournament. There's a tournament we have to join, you know? Um, the comics, I guess there's enough comics where they really had to get away from that, because I don't hear anything about a tournament. Probably the thing that I noticed the most about this book is that there's a lot more, like, TNA fan service type, type stuff than there is in, like, any Dynamite book I read, um... Way, you know, even more than those Lady Death from Co Coffin Comics, which you expect there to be, but there's just a whole bunch of it here, you know. Every opportunity they get, they're uh, drawing Chun-Li or, you know, provocative poses. Good for them, you know? Good for good for these chicks. But um, it was noticeable because it was through the whole book. Uh, but the book was action-packed and fun. Uh, you know, a little, a nice little... Nice little arc for Chun Li to have learned a lesson. Um, this this happens way beyond some stuff that has gone on in the comics for a while. Like M Bison is defeated, and she thinks he's back alive, and the little terrorist organization um, has come back together somehow, sort of Hydra style, many heads kind of thing. So, uh, in the same way, a few months ago, I checked down a Mortal Kombat book, and I still have volume two that I haven't read from the library. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy that. And uh, to me, it's a little bit, you know, I've spent hours and hours of my teenage life playing Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter in lots of quarters, which doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so it was fun. It's fun to read those and, you know, there be an actual story attached to it. And no matter how vapid or lame it is in the context of other comics, it's just so much deeper than it really is in the video game. So. Uh, next up, a few weeks ago, I read The Savage Sword of Conan, The Barbarian. So it's The Savage Sword of Conan, The Barbarian. Um, I, I like this. I like this book fine. Um, I actually like the art a lot. I like the black and white art. Uh, it's more or less generic what I would expect from a Conan of this time. Um, it's not, in my mind, it's not that much brutal in, like, say, what Marvel was doing. Or any of the Jason Aaron stuff, although I I prefer this art. Um, I like the Jason Aaron art. Who was it? Muhammad Asrar was doing that. Um, you know, but the most entertaining part of this was the letters page, which was just basically going, "I don't want that sissy Conan. I want this and this and this. Who's who's you know." I'd like to see more violence, women, and ale, and good brawls. And by Crom's bones, I'm tired of these wimpy letters you get from people out there who think Conan should be a sissy or a wimp. So, you know, it's just been, that's been happening all the time. This book is from 1986. Um, you know, everyone's, uh, this is all the, all the people that think that everyone else is a sissy for this or that and. It's just been happening forever, guys. So, um, I was told by uh, Damien that uh, th these are hit or miss Conans. So, I mean, if they're better than this, then that's awesome. You know, I'll start grabbing these here and there. This one was actually from a 
comic book store in the mall and it was a, more expensive than I wanted it to be, but I, you know, I bought a couple, they're like five bucks each or six bucks or something like that. So I bought a couple though, just cause I wanted to get a taste of the black and white and the magazine size Conan. And that was like years ago. I, I think it was in the middle of the pandemic because I was just buying something cause that store was finally open. <clears throat> you know, walk in with a mask kind of thing and it was in a mall. Uh, next up is, uh, I'm glad I can finally talk about this cause I have to return it soon. Because it's a new book. This is Acting Class by Nick Dronasso. And uh, Sylvia, uh, our friend who's mostly a booktube person, but um, she dips in to the comic stuff with uh, her friends in the comic community uh, um, occasionally. You know, she said what I think a lot of people would say, uh, that, you know, the art isn't immediately appealing. I think at one point I made a comment about... Um, you know, his biggest influence being the the emergency placard that's inside of the inside of a plane that teaches you to put on your mask and stuff when the plane is falling and everyone looks really calm. I think that's a reference in Fight Club also. Um, and so that's what this is, you know. Um, you're gonna you're gonna love it or hate it. Uh, I do think that his like ironic tone fits the you know the the way the art is or supposed to be but it's just a lot you know it's a lot of of that shtick over and over again and uh part of the reason is i think that it's it's just not a tough way to draw right even though you have a whole bunch of panels and a whole bunch of work on it that you can you can churn out a lot you know and the premise of this is that a bunch of people own a, uh, a bunch of people join an acting class. The acting class is a little bit weird. The exercises they do, um, you know, I'll give a lot of uh, character opportunities. Uh, and there are some good characters. The book is long enough that there's a ton of characterization in it. Like you just have no choice, right? And uh, if they're acting and doing these little prompts and stuff, then yeah, you get to find out a lot more about these characters. And I don't want to give up the ending. I mean, it was pretty cool, I guess. Um, maybe I didn't allow myself to see it a mile away, but I think most people will probably see this ending a mile away, uh, or at least not be surprised by it. I mean, overall, it was, it was fine. I think I'm the only person, though, that has read Beverly and now Acting Class, but not Sabrina, which is the thing that I guess... I don't know how famous this guy could be, but he seems to have some kind of measure of fame in like the indie comic circles because um, people are people have that opinion where something is a little bit overrated um, with it is what I've detected for him. Um, but yeah, I own Sabrina. Sabrina's the name of my my little sister, uh, and I just never felt the urgency to read it. Um, but when I got Beverly from the library, because I just grabbed it. You know, I like to check out those books at the library so they keep buying them. Um, uh, someone wanted it back, or someone ordered it, right? So I had like a time limit. I couldn't just reach, keep rechecking it out. So I went and read it right away. That was the beginning of the year. And same with this. Uh, this was like a 14 day. So I was like, oh, I better read it if I'm gonna. Um, I don't think I'll be as quick to read his next book. Uh, and Sabrina, I own it, so eventually I'll just start reading it and just to be a completist on his stuff. So uh, it's good. It's pretty good. It's not that good. Uh, next up is another, I guess, indie-ish thing I'm a little disappointed with. I, You know, I think this is tough for me. Like, this is something I would think is cute if I read it, in, you know, on Instagram and flipped through it. You know, it's hard for me to divorce paying $5.99 for something like this. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people in our group say, oh yeah, we're willing to pay more, you know, for a great artist or whatever. Um, I have the uh, the Jeff Darrow stuff, the Shell and Cowboy stuff, the arts in there be is beautiful. I'm willing to pay the $4.99. The art is so good, you know, it, you know, overlaps, um, the somewhat boring story. It's cute, but boring kind of thing. You have to be in the mood for it. You know, and this is clever. Don't get me wrong. This is like what's happening here is clever. This alien from another world is, likes to collect rocks and someone tells them that, you know, our bones are rocks or whatever and then he gets captured. And then, you know, it's like a cute book, but I mean, 
I don't, I haven't, um, I haven't gotten to some people's level where, where this is good cartooning, uh, for me, you know, but like I said, if it was on Instagram, I would have liked it and I can't divorce the five ninety nine. So take that for what you will. Uh, next up is, you know, I have a, I always just buy these underground books when I can, um, when I can. And, uh, you know, for me, it's a dipping my toe in. Uh, I don't know that I've ever read one that was life changing. And this is the Greg Irons one, but there's some great art in it, which is, I guess, the reason I can't continue to buy them. Because, you know, even though the stories are pretty short and really don't have enough time or space uh, to capture much, and a lot of them are protest stories like this one. Um, you know, a lot of them, this is a little bit more simple art, but it was very, uh, very much a protest story of its time in the mid seventies. Um, and then, you know, you get trippy art. This is all, uh, Greg Irons early work, which by the way, marking this early work definitely makes me want to see that, you know, more Greg Irons. I, I, I suspect that it's not all Greg Irons though, because the art styles are very different in it. And, um, you know, I know that he's associated with, um, Tim Beach, but I don't know if Greg Irons wrote and each drew sometimes or, or how it works. I know in this last one, I know in this last story, and I enjoyed all of these, by the way, um, to different degrees. Some of them are, you know, some of them are a little bit wordy and like, uh, but, um, once you finish them, you're happy with what you got, at least, you know, what you expect. See, I think this might be Tim Beach work here. Um, you know, but either way for something that was supposed to, you know, something that's supposed to showcase Greg Irons, you know, I got a whole bunch of, uh, different art styles actually in there, which was, uh, enjoyable and a, a bunch of different ideas. So I have another one of these, of his early work. So I'll definitely be reading those. And then, um, I think an Instagram, I think an Instagram sale account was, um, selling these. And so. You know, and he threw in a couple. They were like four or five bucks each, but so that's a little more than I'd like to spend. But um, he actually threw in a couple more of them uh, for me because not all of them were really selling. I was remembered correctly. Uh, next up, we got just two more here. Is Satanica versus Morella's Demon, number two, a book by Glenn Danzig and Simon Bisley. So, you know. The, the coloring is very 90s, early 2000s, but I still think, and obviously it's because it's busy, I still think that it's more of an 80s book. The 90s had their, you know, idiocy, don't get me wrong, but this one feels, this one feels more like something that was like done by, in the 80s when obviously the color's different, so imagine it, here's a black and white picture, so looks, that's like, an, looks just like an 80s inside cover. Um, you know, but it's more like a book that someone in Decatur, a comic book store in Decatur, Illinois did or something like that. I mean, and this book is really, really, you know, this makes, the, this makes profit from 1993 or whatever. Well, deep, you know, so I don't know. Bisley is hit or miss. Um, you know, I guess another thing, it also, obviously it's Simon Bisley, so it has the heavy metal feel to it, but, um, um, I didn't buy this on purpose either. You know what I mean? I bought it when I first seen part one in like 2019 and then it's 2022 and it was in my box and I didn't, wasn't going to leave my comic store with it. So I bought it anyway. Why not? Right. I should try to cancel it because I don't want to get another one in 2025 or whatever. And last but not least, I could have swore I talked about this, but I guess not, or maybe I did. And I'll talk about it again is, uh, Beatnik Buenos Aires. This is um, from Fanagraphics. This is this is a Fanagraphics book you can find for like eight bucks used. Um, so maybe it wasn't their uh, you know wasn't their best choice to print. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's from the Underground imprint. Looks like it is. I think that symbol is the Underground imprint. Um, you know, but I read this. Uh, you know, I read this raw without reading the introduction. And so nothing fit and, you know, things were very much like anecdotes and whatnot. I love the art, but you gotta, when you're, when you're, uh, reading black and white art like this, you really do gotta slow down a little bit. 
Um, and maybe if I had read the introduction before, I just didn't feel like reading an introduction at the time. I would have sort of got what was going on here. Um, some of it is a little too dark, but still good. I would have got what was going on here, but what this is, is a, what this is, is like a, I would say it's a companion to, uh, um, a documentary called Opium, um, uh, Beatnik Argentina. So I have Beatnik Buenos Aires. So Opium Beatnik Argentina. And it's really just a documentary about those writers and like the Beatniks or their version of it um, throughout the 60s and 70s. And he couldn't fit every story in the documentaries. What he says is what uh, Diego Arandojo says, that he couldn't fit every story inside of the documentary. So these are a bunch of anecdotes and stories that didn't fit and so that's why they're all ill-fitting and he just had um uh, facundo facundo persio it's just really hard to read that font right there um draw them and yeah they were good for what they are they're just these little like vignettes you know they don't any have have any real plot you know not enough pages for any characterization unless i knew you know some of the writers or whatnot, but um, it was good, and it's and it's actually cheap online. So if you just want um, something that's more or less an anthology, but by the same people and about like a moment in time in Argentina, then uh, then it's probably worth like the, I think I've seen it for like eight bucks in shipping or something, five bucks in shipping. So definitely enjoyed it. I've been wanting to read this for a long time, but I think that I thought it was a a full story um, when I bought it or when I was planning to read it. Anyway, that's all I got. And I went, uh, I went 30 minutes. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. I will see you later. Swamp thinks says goodbye.